start our lecture, finish up this week strong. Um, so hopefully everybody feels pretty good about the assignments we've been working on this week since you had an extra day to do uh, last week's lab and ICA from last week. Hopefully that was that was helpful. You don't feel maybe quite so underwater. Um, that's going to be a, kind of a normal feeling in this class. I feel like there's a whole lot of deadlines coming. So I, I get that. This is still just the best way I've found to both keep, make it so y'all aren't cramming during finals week or midterms week and trying to learn six weeks of material at once. Um, you might feel a little overwhelmed now, but imagine how if I wasn't forcing you to do all these assignments now, how you feel during the finals week if you hadn't been keeping up on some of this stuff. Um, so I get that it's a lot, there's a lot of time commitment for this class. Um, but that's why it's so important to, when you can, turn in the assignments as fast as you can, get them done that day as much as possible, since you have all that time to work on the ICAs and things like that. Um, the more you can turn in the day up, um, the less you'll have those extra deadlines hanging over your head. Um, because I know, personally, when I get to a point where I've got more than like say three things that I have to do uh, do on the same deadline or that I have outstanding, uh, then I start just sort of panicking and, and locking up and um, uh, I get even worse about it. It's one of those things where it becomes like a self-sabotage, right? Where you think, oh, I have these three things that I need to do and I can't decide which one of them I'm going to start with since they're all late. So I'm just going to not do any of them um, becomes the way my brain works. Um, so, the more you can prevent yourself from getting in that position, most of you will do best if you if you avoid that. Um, that said, every year I have one or two people that have that don't turn in anything until the week of finals, other than like the quizzes. So they'll do the quizzes and they'll show up to all the labs, but they won't turn in anything until the week of finals, and then they turn everything in at once, which I've never quite understood that, but. It happens um, if that's you. Don't feel singled out. So let's accept that. It'll still be marked late. But um, anyway, I'm rambling. I didn't get much sleep last night. I apologize in advance for this lecture. Um, all right, let's, let's talk. We're going to keep going with atomic theory and um, start talking. We might get into talking about some quantum stuff today. Um, oh, sorry. Before I forget, heads up. Next Thursday, I'm going to send out an announcement for next Thursday's lecture. It will either be be canceled and I'll, and you'll be doing your ICA for next week during lecture time instead of during labs and do lecture a lecture during labs instead. Because um, I have to go down to the Bay Area on Thursday uh, afternoon, so if I can't find a sub. Um, then we're going to have to get creative with that. So just watch for an announcement. Thursday's schedule will be different next week. I don't know what it's like yet, but just pay attention to it, okay? All right. Uh, somebody did take me up on my offer to ask about chemical engineering. So chemical engineering is basically chemistry, but practically speaking. So in, in chemistry, we're interested in what can we do, what's the outer limits of what's possible, given what we understand, and figuring out why it happens. Chemical engineering is how do we scale up the things that the chemists are already doing. Chemists know how to do this, but they're making half a gram at a time of this pharmaceutical set. How do we scale it up so that we can make half a ton of it at a time? So things like Aspirin. A chemist figured out how to make aspirin. A chemical engineer took it and turned it into something that they could mass produce. Um, a chemist figured out what all the components in crude petroleum are, and a chemical engineer figured out how to scale up a refinery so that they could produce millions of barrels of uh, refined products every every day instead of you know doing it 500 milliliters at a time. And so. Scale up, figuring out, the, and when you scale things up, you get all sorts of other practical issues. Like, well, what happened? What's to the flow rate of crude petroleum? If you try to pipe crude petroleum um, from these holding tanks into your distillation tower, the width of the pipe, 
affects how it flows and how much force you have to pump in order to get it to move properly. And so all of those sort of practical problems, including the economics of, um, of it is, is really what chemical engineering is. And for a long time, basically from about 1950s, ah, really more like in late, late 40s, probably 30s forward until just about 10 years ago, chemical engineering is basically petroleum chemistry. It was all based on petroleum because that's where all the money was. In the mid 2000s or so, it started, pharmaceuticals started picking up more and alternative energy sources started picking up more and chemical engineering became, started to become more of those other fields as well. But it's still dominated by people that are going to graduate and go work for Chevron um, at this point. I guess I have been out of grad school now for 10 years. So maybe that's changed in the last 10 years. That's what it was like when I was in the chemical engineering department. Um, so it, and it does start to bring in economics. If you want to do a startup of any sort involving chemistry, you're probably looking more at chemical engineering because you're starting small scale and figuring out how to build it up bigger. Um, so a lot of chemical engineering grad students go on to make startups, um, which then get bought out by Chevron. Um, that's really like most fields in the sciences. If you do a startup these days, the end result is almost always, it's a good product that you get bought by a bigger company and you take your payday um, and go make another startup or you retire at, you know, 28, um, depending on your personality, which is incidentally how Elon Musk got his start, right? Elon Musk got his start. What was his first product that he sold? Anybody remember? PayPal. Elon Musk developed and designed PayPal from the ground up. And when it got bought by maybe eBay, I don't remember who bought PayPal first. I think it was eBay. Um, he was a billionaire in his 20s. And then he turned around and started investing into things like Tesla and, um, and SpaceX before he then went off the rails and started trying to buy Twitter for some reason. Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. So chemical engineering is a lot of the practical side. How do you make money with chemistry? How do you develop new products? Some of it can be altruistic, like finding alternative energy and things like that. But it's more concerned with the, the real world limitations and how to get around them um, versus look at this cool compound that I can make um, if I use this catalyst that costs $10,000 per gram. Um, to make this particular platinum rhodium alloy. Um, the chemical, so actually catalytic converters are a good example of a product that a chemical engineer came up with because chemists figured out that you could take exhaust and treat it with a mixture of rhodium, palladium, and, and platinum, and it would break down that exhaust and leave, turn it into things that were less harmful to the environment and less harmful to, to breathe. But rhodium, palladium, and platinum are exceptionally expensive. So the chemical engineers said, well, if we tweak the ratio just right and we make the inside of a catalytic converter, basically it's like a um, mesh of spiderweb thin wires um, because they're trying to minimize the amount of, of metal that they have to put in there while maximizing the amount of surface area. That's all done by the chemical engineer after the chemists say, hey, this is a pretty cool thing we just found out how to do. So it's a, it's a totally different mindset. They're also very interesting and really fun problem solving to do, um, but very, very different. Um, and believe it or not, I have a short answer to this one. The oddest phenomenon that I know to occur in nature is consciousness. The weirdest thing about the universe is that the universe can perceive itself by way of us being conscious. That's a really weird thing. I find that weirder than anything we're going to get into in quantum mechanics personally. Um, but, and there's plenty more to unpack there if you want to get into neurology. And last but not least, Nobel Prizes. Um, the Nobel Prizes were awarded for the sciences this week. Uh, they announced literature today. These prizes coming out tomorrow, I think. Um, but chemistry, in particular, is really interesting to me this year because I worked on reactions that were pioneered by Bertozzi and Sharpless um, when I was in grad school. My grad school research was on the reactions um, that 
in our research lab, we just called it the Bertozzi reaction and the Sharpless reaction. Um, that, that style of chemistry was my expertise in grad school. And there was a brief moment in time when I knew more about the click reaction that Carolyn Bertozzi uses than literally anybody else on the planet, which was really, really cool. Didn't make up for the long hours and low pay, but it was kind of cool to be able to say that. Um, and I would still suspect that most people in the computational chemistry world haven't caught on to the fact that it's a multi-reference reaction. But that's, again, neither here nor there. Um, Barry Sharpless in particular is a really interesting guy. I think he's at UC San Diego still. And he's the only the fifth person in the in the history of the Nobel Prizes to win two Nobel Prizes. And only the second time it's ever been done with two Nobel Prizes, both in chemistry. Um, a guy named Sanger won two Nobel Prizes for um, develop, figuring out the structure of insulin and I'm blanking on what Sanger's other one was. Um, but other than that, it's really, that's a really, really small group. He's a really cool guy, you know, a mo modern day, you know, giant in the field of uh, organic chemistry. And Carolyn Bertozzi is by all accounts, just a gem of a person. I've emailed with her a couple of times and she was very, very kind. Um, and uh, I've heard that that's just the way she is, which is always fun when somebody that's nice actually gets to the top of the field, right? Um, so, and then the physics had to do with the entanglement. And I just show you because I really appreciated this quote from in his acceptance speech, one of the Nobel laureates in physics says, that was a big waste of time. Now let's start doing some real physics. They had to prove that something could be done before they could actually start doing anything practical with it or learning anything. Basically what they figured out is that quantum mechanics is right. Um, they proved that quantum entanglement works at a distance, even though the two the two molecules or the two particles should not be able to interact with each other because they're so far away from each other. I'm pulling my hands out here. They're probably more like this far away. It's already too far for them to interact with each other. They're not such tiny particles. Um, but they were able to show that even though the particles shouldn't be able to see each other, if they were entangled in a certain way, if you flip one of them, the other one flips two. Um, and the next thing to prove is whether or not that happens faster than the speed of light. Because right now, the, the current understanding suggests it doesn't, but there have been some rumblings and some people who disagree with some of the mathematics behind it to say that it, sh that it should happen faster than the speed of light, which would be really groundbreaking. Um, but I don't think that that's... Unlikely, we'd be able to quantify it because if it, the most, if that was true, uh, I can't really speculate on that because it'd be, it's so, I have no idea what the mechanism or how they would even measure that or what that would look like. So I don't want to guess that far outside my field. Just one of the rare times where you will hear me say that because I usually love to speculate on other people's specialties. Um, and if you want a, there's a good link here if you want to learn about that reaction um, that Bertozzi and Sharpless worked on. Um, they basically, Bertozzi figured out how to use this reaction to study how cells work. They, could figure out how to label certain molecules with um, with um, and attach them like a seatbelt. They call it click chemistry because it's like a seatbelt. It irreversibly links two molecules together in a way that you can use in living cells, um, and then you can track that with a fluorescent label um, if you have that attached to the cycloalkyne that's reacting. So it basically allowed for a way people to figure out what was happening in the cells by literally shining a light on these organelles and seeing with a microscope what is glowing when you do that. All right, then some more relevant questions. What's the difference between a chemical process and a physical process or chemical change and a physical change? This is something I struggle with teaching because it doesn't really fit nicely into any of the chapters that we cover in this part of the class, um, but they're terms that you should probably know. So thank you. I don't remember who asked this, but thanks for asking 
this um, because it really depends on who you're asking and how you define physical versus chemical. Because if you get zoomed in enough, every change is a physical change. And we kind of sort of have to arbitrarily decide, well, this is what we're deciding is a chemical change versus a physical change. But even physical change, we can write as a chemical reaction. So there isn't really that big of a difference between them, but it's one of those things that has always been taught in chemistry classes. This is a physical change. And this is a, a chemical change. Um, but there's not really any consistent criteria, um, which means I don't really like teaching it because I don't want to teach you something that's going to be different, taught differently in five years necessarily. Um, so it, what's considered a physical process is generally, if you're not changing what the compound is, if it's the same compound before and after, then it's a physical change. If you're changing one compound into another compound, that's the chemical change. Um, so, for instance, burning burning propane to make CO two and water. You don't have propane anymore afterwards. That's going to be a chemical change. You still have all the same pieces. The chemical, the covalent bonds are just different. So, but then. If we start looking at, okay, well, what about melting water? We can, if we write, and I'll teach you how to write chemical reactions um, in a little bit, but just for now, we start with solid water, AKA ice, and it turns into liquid water. That's usually considered a physical process. We can write it like a chemical reaction, and we can actually write out the energetics of it, like it's a chemical reaction, and predict what temperature is going to happen based on different on um, different uh, pressures and things like that. So we can treat it like it's a chemical reaction, but it's usually classified as a physical reaction. So it gets it gets really you know you can debate the semantics all day back and forth. So I want you to be aware that there's that difference. I'm not going to ever ask you about the difference between a chemical process and a physical process. Um, but I want you to be aware of that terminology in case you go on to another school or have to take a standardized test that uses those terms. In general, chemical means it's not the same compound. Physical means you either just mixed it together or you changed phases. Or you changed the shape of something. Like if you took a hunk of gold and you hammered it into gold foil, it's still gold before and after. It just is a different shape. That would be a physical change. And then we're going to talk about some more forces, especially when we get into quantum. So this was a relevant question. I thought, why are there so many different kinds of forces in chemistry? Um, it turns out, actually, chemistry only really cares about one force until you get into nuclear chemistry. Um, and it's electromagnetic force. Everything in chemistry pretty much comes down to where are the charges and how do they interact with each other? All of the different chemical reactions that happen have to do with you basically follow the electrons. These electrons have a negative charge, therefore they're attracted to a positive charge and they're going to be pulled this way. Beyond that, the other forces, the other three other forces are the strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, only come into play when we talk about nuclear chemistry, nuclear reactions, and gravity, which we basically ignore in chemistry because we're dealing with gravity is attraction between two um, objects that have mass, right? Well, it's based on how much mass your objects have. We're talking about the scale of an individual atom or molecule. The attraction between that molecule and ground is so small as to be negligible. So we just kind of ignore it in chemistry. So physics has to deal with all, with all four forces, probably not at the same time because they all work at different scales. When you're really, really zoomed in, it's strong and weak force. And when you're really, really zoomed out, it's just gravity. And in between, you might have some interaction between them. But for the most part, for chemistry, it's all electromagnetic force. And in organic chemistry, especially, every mechanism that you will learn is, I can't say every, I think every mechanism you will learn um, is 
Where are the electrons and what are they attracted to? Follow the electrons and you can figure out what it makes down the road. Which ties into how does the universe work? It's just four forces and just how they interact with each other. And you put them in certain situations, you get different products. You get them close enough, then electric, then strong and weak force take over. The far part is just gravity. Um, maybe a better question is why does the universe work? But now we're getting back into philosophy and cosmology and away from my area. So we'll leave that there. 42. 42. Um, my, my answer is why is why is there something rather than nothing? Why did the big, big bang happen? It's because it's more stable than not happening, and things tend to progress toward being more stable. So you know, why does anything happen? Because it's more stable than not, it's easier than not happening. All right, so this is where we left off the other day, talking about isotopes versus elements versus ions. And so all three of these are talking about similar properties. They're all based on the number of what three particles? Protons, protons and electrons, and protons and neutrons. Right, so that's always going to be for all three of these different ways of categorizing atoms. All these are all just different ways of categorizing atoms and classifying them based on those three subatomic particles. They call them subatomic particles because they're less than an atom, they're smaller than an atom. Um, so when you when your parents ask you what you learned in school this week, you can say, we learned about subatomic particles. And you're going to feel really, they're going to sound really smart anyway. You might not feel really smart if they press you on it. And you can't say more than protons. Protons are a thing. But that's basically what it is. Protons are a thing that have a positive charge, and they make up part of the nucleus. Electrons have next to no mass, and they're not in the nucleus, but they have a charge. Neutrons have mass, but no charge. Neutron neutral. Right. So, with that in mind, let's practice writing some of these out using the, the um, proper symbols. And I will reiterate what we said before is for any atom X, if that's the atomic symbol, this is how many is down and to the right. This is your net charge. This is your mass number. And this, I don't use this one very much because it's redundant. But down and to the left, if you ever have a number written there, it's the atomic number. So why would I say the atomic number is redundant? Because the symbol already tells us that, right? If we have our periodic table, which we always will, then you don't really need to write the atomic number. So I typically don't. Sometimes you do need to write the mass number if you're speaking, talking about a specific isotope. So that one does come up. But most frequently are these two places. The superscript to the right for charge, the subscript to the right for how many do you have? All right, so based on that, go ahead and try and uh, fill in this chart. I'll give everybody a few minutes before I start working through it. Ask each other if you need help. If there's no charge written, you assume it's neutral. And if there's no number written, you assume you have one of them.
And really to be most accurate with these names, if we have a specific isotope being specified here, if they just say carbon, it's generally assumed to be the, the mixture of carbon isotopes that we find in nature. If you, if you have a specific isotope um, indicated, then you want to say that as part of the name. It's written after the name. So this would be carbon 13 would be the, the official name of that sample. So we're specifically talking just about one isotope. So this one wouldn't be chlorine, it would be what? Chlorine 35. Chlorine 35. And part of the reason we even have to specify that, we don't really need a name and a symbol, except that it's hard to say the symbol out loud. We're trying to, I'm trying to communicate verbally. It's really hard to describe this. But it's easy. It's a lot easier if you have the pro proper terms, and you could say something like um, a a negatively charged chlorine thirty five. So, how many protons for carbon? Always six, right? It's neutral because we don't have a charge specified. So six electrons, that's already in there for us. And how many neutrons do we have? Seven. All right, so I wanna reiterate that when, when a specific number or a specific mass number is given, we're not referring to the periodic table to see how many neutrons we have, right? Because the periodic table would say that carbon's got an atomic mass of really close to 12. And so we would just think, oh, I subtract six protons from it. But if we're specifying an isotope, this is the isotope we're talking about. It doesn't matter what the atomic mass is on the periodic table. So for the chlorine 35 ion, we got 17, it's the atomic number, chlorine. Yeah. And then that makes neutrons 35 minus 17, so 18. And how many electrons? So if it was neutral, it would be 17. It's got a negative one charge, which means it has one extra electron. So 18 electrons. What element has it has three protons? Lithium. And what isotope of lithium do we have? Protons plus neutrons. Seven. So it's lithium seven. Which means we can also start to fill in the symbol here. Lithium seven. Again, it's a little redundant, but if you want it to be as complete as possible, you could put the three for the atomic number. Again, I'm not going to ever ask you to do that, but I want you to be familiar with what that means. Does it have a charge? No. As the same number of protons and electrons. If protons are all plus one, we have three plus ones, and we also have three electrons that are all minus one. So three plus ones and three minus ones add up to zero. So no charge. Which reminds me of the bad chemistry joke. A helium atom walks into a bar. Bartender pours him a beer. The Healy madam says, Thanks, how much? The bartender says, For you, no charge. But I'll. More than you know. <laughs> All right, what do we have for calcium down here? We know it's going to be 20 protons because it's calcium. So, by definition, it's 20 protons. 20 neutrons means it's calcium, or sorry, 22 neutrons means it's calcium what? 
42. So again, if you look at the periodic table, it's mostly calcium 40 in natural samples. So your atomic mass on the periodic table is close to 40, right? But this particular atom or this particular sample is we're saying it's calcium 42. Right, we're specifically we're specifically specifying. We are specifying which isotope we have. So I mean, it doesn't matter what ratio it normally occurs in nature on Earth. Our sample is calcium forty two. So we can put we can write in calcium. We can put forty two up into the left, and we're missing two electrons compared to the protons. So plus two. And just a note about charges in particular. I'm gonna write this a little, actually I'm just gonna way up the screen here. Sometimes we switch that where the sign and the charge number are. Um, basically for reasons of legibility when you type these things out. So calcium two plus and calcium plus two are the same thing. We do that mostly because um, there are certain, certain combinations of letters and charges that make it really hard to see when it's typed. So if I have bromine with a negative one charge, when I'm writing it by hand, it's pretty easy to make sure you could see it. But if you type that, especially if it's typed in a small font, it's really easy for that negative sign to run into the R, depending on the font you choose, which means it can be really hard to tell what the charge is you're saying. And so that, that's called kerning. It's a computer science issue. I have no idea where that term comes from, but kerning is basically trying to make sure that your letters don't run into each other, no matter what combination you have. And superscripts mess with that. And so there are some times where, especially when you're typing things, um, where you would want to switch those to avoid that negative sign and the um, R from running together. Because if you sit, if you write it like this, one minus, it's a lot easier to see that one next to the R than the minus sign. So all that just to say, I use them interchangeably and I don't, the more I think about it, the more I find no rhyme or reason to why, why I say plus two or two plus, they mean the exact same thing to a chemist. Um, so don't get hung up on that. I'm not trying to say two different things. It's not a trick question. It's just, they get used interchangeably. All right, any questions on these kind of charts? You did one on the ICA, it was the first thing everybody did. Now you've done another one here, gone through all the common stumbling blocks. Um, that's, this is great that nobody has questions because I will tell you right now, at least on the midterm, but I think on the midterm and on the final. On the midterm, being able to do that is worth 10% of the grade. So one out of the 10 sections on the midterm is just, can you count protons, neutrons, and electrons, or you write them properly? And I believe it's 5% on the final. On the final, you still have to be able to do that. But by then, it should be so, so much second nature um, that you don't even have to think about it. And I tell you this because I really, really hate taking away points because you forgot how to count protons and neutrons. It happens every year. Nope, I've never been able to give us 100% all the way through on this one, but it's usually like two people miss half a point, right? So get those easy points on the tests in this class. I make you work for your points usually. So when I give you easy points, get them. All right. This is just recapping what we've already been talking about. Um, but I wanted to put some numbers out there because it seems weird that we kind of ignore electrons when it comes to mass, especially. Um, but if you actually look at the size 
I had it wrong when I was talking in the lab. Um, I said that a neutron was slightly smaller than a proton, but that's the other way around. Um, if you look at these relative sizes in AMU of protons, neutrons, and electrons, it takes about 2,000 electrons to have the mass of one proton. So for the most part, within sick days, we don't worry about electrons affecting the mass. That you're not never going to have enough electrons around a single atom to noticeably change the mass. Especially considering most ions are the largest charges we typically will see are going to be in the from let's say from negative four to plus seven or about it's about the biggest range of charges you can have commonly found on, on ions. So if you if you have a plus seven charge. Oh no, I'm missing 0 0.003 of a proton. That's really not going to affect your mass much at all, right? Especially considering it's usually balanced out by something with a negative charge being attached to that plus seven. So for the most part, we ignore electrons when it comes to mass. Um, and remember, neutrons have no charge. until we get into quarks and subatomic particles and beta particles and nuclear reactions. And that stuff's all super interesting and fun, but we don't need to worry about it yet. And again, since protons and electrons have the same charge, but with opposite signs, we don't really deal with the numbers in this class. We're not gonna calculate the magnetic field or anything. That's more of a physics problem where you would you could do something like, okay, you've got a mole of electrons passing through a wire. What does that do in terms of Coulombs to the magnetic field? You could, you can do those calculations in a physics class, but this isn't a physics class. So we just count them. Plus one or minus one, based on how many you gained or lost. So there is a charge, but we kind of ignore it. Everything other than counting. All right, there's more practice there, but it's already filled in and uh, I'll, we can do that over break. Anybody wants more practice on those? All right, reminder of how atomic mass works. Half of you just heard me say this a couple hours ago, the other half heard me say it yesterday. Um, all of the atomic mass masses on the periodic table are measured numbers. And they're listed officially as AMU. This is a mass for a single atom. But if you take AMU and you multiply it by Avogadro's number, you get one gram. So one AMU times six times 10 to the 23rd is one gram, which allows us to say that one AMU per atom is the same as one gram per mole. Right? Because if you think about it in terms of a conversion, AMU per atom, and for every 6.022, 10 to the 23rd atoms, it's one mole, right? And if we use the same conversion that's just written right there, for every 6 times 10 to the 23rd, AMU, it's one gram. We're multiplying the same number top and bottom, right? Totally cancels out. It allows us to say AMU per atom is equal to grams per mole. So, and this is what I'm going to, this is a dead giveaway and it's one, something we're going to do in this class all the time. If you ever see a word problem that at this starts with a mass and asks you to convert to moles, can I say always? I think I can say always. Always go to the atomic mass or the molecular mass because that's a straightforward one-to-one -one or one-step conversion to go from grams to moles. It can get a little tricky if I make you go from pounds to grams first or something like that. But if you want to get to moles, this is our only way at this point. We'll gradually add a few more options to get to moles. 
If we want to count atoms at this point from something we can measure, boom, grab some moles. So essentially, it's like yes, right, like some moles. So say that say that one. You have three grams of iron, and you're trying to figure out how many moles of iron is. So if we have three grams of iron, so this is in grams per one mole. So if we have three grams of iron, say 3.0, so we have some sig figs. For every 55.845 grams, that's one mole of iron. So we would say, okay, cancel, set it up so that grams cancels out. Grams, 55.845 goes on bottom. One mole goes on top. And so it'd be three divided by 55. And so, the, and again, and I'm glad you phrased it that way because it's, I'm getting the same answer for people when people ask me questions about density. Like, oh, to get the mass from, from the density, you just take the mass and divide by the density or do you multiply? I don't know, whatever makes units work, right? So it's not, do you multiply by 55845 five, or do you divide by 55845? Five, five, I don't know, make the units work out. You've got grams, you make grams cancel out. You've got moles, you make moles cancel out. All right, so that way you don't need to worry about memorizing formulas or things like that. You can just watch your units. We're good at unit conversions in here now. Whether, whether you feel like you are or not yet, you are. You'll get better and more confident. And Little did you know, this was the next part of this. Maybe you didn't know, maybe you were looking at the slide. If we want to know how many grams are in 3.42 moles of iron, we flip it. 3.42 moles, and it can be helpful to specify of iron. And for every one mole, it's 55, 845 grams. So in that case, we multiply by the atomic mass. If we have 10 grams and we want to figure out how many moles, we'll be dividing, make the units work out. And again, it's, it's something that would be really, really cool to see in my lifetime, um, that we had to have different periodic tables based on whether you lived on Mars or on Earth. On Mars, there's likely a different concentration of isotopes for iron. <clears throat> if that's the case, your atomic mass of iron on Mars is not going to be the same as your atomic mass of iron on Earth. Each individual isotope will weigh the same, but you'll have a different mixture of them, just like that magnesium problem we did. What's the variation between here and Mars that makes the difference? Uh, it has to do with the way that the solar system forms. All of the planets were, out, um, if we exclude anything that came from outside of uh, our solar system, um, all came from the same supernova of a star that, that was before our current sun. Um, and so when that supernova happened and then everything kind of collapsed back towards itself, all the high, most of the hydrogen and helium turned into our sun. A lot of the other elements gradually accreted into into planets, um, but the different densities of the materials and the different atomic masses of the various elements meant that certain planets have more of certain isotopes and certain elements. That's why Jupiter is almost entirely hydrogen, but Neptune is entirely water. It's just whatever happened. Whatever happens to coalesce together in certain, and that we can't guarantee that all of that, those things have the same isotopic ratios. Um, and in fact, that's one of the ways one, that we can tell there was a meteorite a couple of years ago um, that they could prove by looking at the isotopic mixtures that it did not come from our solar system because it has a different ratio of certain isotopes compared to anything else in our solar system. So we get a lot of times the set of isotopes that are interesting to make sense for us. They have certain isotopes so every isotope has its own mass that is going to be set in stone universally. Um, how many of those isotopes 
you have on average? Do you have one deuterium atom per thousand regular hydrogens, or do you have two deuteriums for every thousand? That's going to change your atomic mass. And that's something that depended on the formation for that double triangle. Which again is pretty cool, at least to me. All right, let's do another example with four because everybody loved, loved the Galena and the lead problem so much last week. Oh, this is an easier one though. Iron is typically found as iron ore, and that iron ore is iron oxide, basically rust in mineral form. Um, and it's 69.9% iron by mass. If we found an iron ore deposit that was 100.4 kilograms, how many moles of iron do you have? I'm not gonna work it all the way through first right away, but what's our, our roadmap gonna look like? What conversions are we gonna try to do? Kilograms. Kilograms to, to grams. Never a bad idea to start with that since we don't like working in kilograms. We can help it. Again, this is not a physics class. Physicists go home. Just, you, you're welcome. I, I don't know if anybody's major in physics, but you're welcome to stay, of course. What do we do from that? Once we have grams, what is it grams of? The ore. Can we do anything with the ore? What can we do, Jack? Um, we say 100 grams of ore gives us 69.9 grams of iron. So we can go grams of ore to grams of iron. I'm, I'm purposely not putting it in the detail so, so that everybody gets practice with it. Once we're in grams of ore, we can get to grams of iron. Grams of iron, what do we do? Get to moles. So a lot of times when I'm writing out these, these plans, I'll start adding details for the little arrows when I picture, okay, this is where I'm gonna use the density or this is where I'm using the atomic mass. This is where we're using the atomic mass. This is where we're using that percent by mass. And we don't need to, we don't need to think very hard about how to get from kilograms to grams, right? So if you haven't yet, try and write it out. So filling in the details, 100.4 kilograms of ore. And really we could do the percent by mass to go from kilograms of ore to kilograms of iron here. Our percent by mass doesn't mean it has to be grams to grams. It could be kilograms to kilograms or pounds to pounds. But for now, since we had it labeled that way first, we can say one kilogram, 10 to the three grams of ore. And notice I'm not going to be super picky about saying, making these descriptive terms cancel out, especially if it's kilograms of ore to grams of ore. As long as I know that I started with kilograms of ore, it's still that ore is still there, or that descriptor is still there. And then how do we use that percentage? We could turn it to a decimal, but we don't need to because we have, if we're going to write it out as a conversion, then, then that turning it into a decimal is built into the fact that we can assume what? That it's out of 100. For every 100 grams of ore, we get 69.9 grams of iron. And 
and then we use our periodic table. For every 55.845 grams, we get one mole of iron. And so if you were using your percentage as a decimal, it would be for every one gram of ore, you get 0.699 grams. So I, that still works just as well, but since it's already written as a percentage, might as well just make it out of 100. Good question. Or either. This is a measured number. So is your but so is 100.4 and the percentage is measured number two. So we only get three sig figs out of this, which makes it how many moles? Ten to the three. Is that what I heard? All right, so this is about as complicated as it can get at this point. If you're trying to get to moles, I can make it hard to get to grams. But once you get to grams, it's one step. You use your periodic table, you use grams and moles. I was brainstorming questions um, for the take home final in, in lab today. <laughs> So the absolute trickiest way I could incorporate this would be something like giving you that copper and lead problem from last week with the system of equations. And the final answer was how many moles of protons are in the box? So you would have to start by figuring out how many grams of copper and how many grams of lead there are. And then you would have to do what you did with the lead problem today and figure out how many moles of protons from copper and how many moles of protons from lead. And then you could add them up to get a total number, right? Ooh. I could make it really long, but I can't really give you anything you haven't seen already. Now that you've done that copper and lead problem and you did the black hole problem and some of the geometry stuff, that is literally as complicated as math for this class gets. So you've seen everything as mathematically. And that is probably more. That's a trickier problem than I would ask you on the take home final, unless I led you through it in a multi part question like solve, solve for mass of copper and mass of lead, and then ask um, how many moles of protons are there total, right? So that kind of leads you a little bit, gives you a plan. That's typically the way I do the take home problems or multi part problems that build on each other. Jack? So those word problems, those are like a take home one. Yes. The, um, the quiz questions, I know not everybody gets to work in groups on the quiz problems, so those are designed so that so that if you're keeping up with stuff, you can do the quiz problems on your own. The ICAs and the take home problems um, are supposed to be harder and more complicated, and they, they should follow that trend. On the take home, usually I give one that if you're if you can, yeah, there's going to be an Excel problem where you have to do some calculations and plot something. And there's going to be a tricky system of equations, and there's going to be a lot of basically one of like the tricky problems from each of the ICAs. Some version of that will show up on the take home, um, but it won't be anything that just is totally boring. Yeah, I think I can say that. All right. Let's take a break. And let's come back at five after and we'll work with more dice folks. Yeah, 
So I got the gold pumps and the gap. So I have that. 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 That would start from here until it had this many moles of water and every water that would be added to the height of one another. And then it would be added to the height of one another. And then it would be added to the height of one another. So it would be added to the height of one another. Just on my 
Just get through lecture that much faster. 
Um, I, I had a student once who, it was the first time I ever got recorded regularly. He had his, his phone suspended from the ceiling so that he could see the board um, because we didn't have any test screens or anything like this. And he uploaded it all to YouTube and he watched YouTube videos incessantly at double speed. Like, I swear to God, sometimes two at a time. Yeah, so I could not follow it, but worked for him. So whatever works for you, if you need to see anything else that, um, that we worked on, check the recording. And then the key for all of the different ICAs will, will get posted. Um, usually I make you work on it on your own for a day or two at least. And then a couple of days later, you'll have access to the key. So um, the ICA2 key I posted just yesterday because I, I thought I had a copy that saved, it didn't, so I had to write a new one and I took a bit. Um, and then this week's, I posted it late for the key already, but you won't have access to it as a student until I think I put it Friday at midnight, since I just need to officially start the assignment today. Um, so October 8th at 12 a.m., you have access to the, to the key, um, and you can check your answers there. If anything doesn't make sense, if you don't know why I did something, um, like for instance, I got, I got really, a little bit sloppy to getting my logic with the key on the black hole problem um, because I was doing it while people were also asking me questions and I was trying to get it up as fast as I could. So I threw a random one fourth in there when it came to the, the volume of the black hole part for getting finding the radius of the black hole. Um, and that was, you know, I, I didn't say where that came from. It was because you were given the diameter of the moon, not the radius. And then the problem said that the black hole was half the radius of that. Hole. So you had to cut it in half twice. That's where that one quarter came from. Um, and then if you were off by a random factor of a thousand on the mass of the black hole, just so because I know there were a couple people looking for this in that I couldn't find this in my own work for a little bit. Um, if you found it was easy to mess up the um, when you were finding the mass of the black hole, it was easy to forget that 1,000 factor. You got, went through all the trouble of finding the mass of, mass of the sun, then you would have gotten something times 10 to the 33rd. But then remember the black hole was 1,000 times bigger than that. So then you had to multiply by 1,000 again to get 10 to the 36. Um, either that or you forgot to convert from, gram, from kilograms to grams. Those are the two places where you could be off by a factor of a thousand really easily. Um, and this is the one that I myself missed until um, I, looked at, I looked at somebody else. Was that the one you were looking for, Jim? So, and anytime that you're looking at the key, this is just a, a I don't know if trick is the right word, um, but if you're looking at the key and you have the right coefficient, if you have the right number, but the wrong number of decimal places, that's usually either a calculator error. You typed in divide by 10 when you meant divide by 100. Um, or you forgot to convert you know, kilograms to grams or something like that. If you did everything right, you, got this, you would get the same coefficient but with a different power. That's usually what happens there. And that's what I call slipping a decimal place or slipping a digit. It just means that you lost a, um, you missed something somewhere probably when you entered it into your calculator. All right, so that's something to watch for. It means that you're almost there. Even if you're off by a factor of a thousand, it means that you're just one thing that you're missing almost all the time. Was there a hand I saw? Chase? I just had a big, big question. Yes. Yeah. On this one, because I got something a little bit Yes, different. I think I did mess up my sig figs at some point. Is it the 1.4 right there? I ran the check right Yeah. 2.0. And because we only have two sig figs on the volume of the sun, um, because we only had two sig figs on the radius of the sun, so this should only be two six. So it should be 2.0 times 10 to the 33rd, not 1.96. Okay. Which, and this is sort of thing that I'm not going to be checking your sig figs in the middle of the calculation. So if you got down to the end and had one extra sig fig on top, but you still had two like you were supposed to on the bottom, your final answer will still come out to two sig figs, right? So either way, if I was grading my own paper here, 
I ended with the right number of sig figs, even if I accidentally carried an extra one in here. And so that would still be, I would not mark, mark off sig figs at any point from there. Um, especially if it's not a number that you boxed. If you boxed it and you draw my attention to it and you have your sig figs wrong, then okay, maybe I would find that and take off a quarter of a point. But in general, um, I'm mostly worried that you get to the right number of sig figs at the end or when you change operations. <clears throat> right. Any other questions? There was something else. Oh, also just a, a encouraging, hopefully, note. It is totally normal to feel like you're uncomfortably behind because in this class, we do things really fast and we're adding lots of new topics really fast, right? As soon as you get good at something, I make it hard to get. That's kind of what science, what science classes do. Here's something, let's practice it until we get really, really good at it. And now it's way harder because I'm going to pile something else on top of it. Um, that's normal. We're going to keep building on it and you're going to continue to feel uncomfortable because it's a hard class. It takes a lot of work. Um, but I'll periodically remind you, like, hey, yes, these conversions are really hard. But think about how easy it is to go from kilometers to you know, to light years now, um, just using your conversion sheet. All of those straightforward conversions that you can do in your sleep practically. Um, hopefully while you were working on this, you might've been dreaming in conversions, that's normal. Um, and you're way better at those. You might still feel lost on the stuff we're doing now, but that's what it's new. You'll get there with these two, okay? So don't, don't panic too much. A little bit of panic, a little bit of stress is okay. Um, but I don't want I don't want anybody crying more than once or twice a week about this class. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I will be totally honest. I had moments in my undergrad career where I had classes where I was in tears because I was exhausted and I could not figure out this one fucking problem. And it was mattered a lot because it was one of three problems on, on this homework set. So it's just like your ICA problems. But that's normal. We'll get through that. Um, you need to come talk to me if you need an extension because you're sleep deprived or something like that or your work's crazy let me know we'll talk about it and we'll get you back on schedule um, but at this point i'm not worried about anybody in this room passing this class everybody in this room i've seen enough of your work and answered enough questions to work with you enough that i know everybody in here has the ability barring unforeseen circumstances um, to pass this class so you keep doing what you're doing, showing up, working. Um, everybody in here is going to be fine. It just might not feel like it from time to time, which is when you need to take a break, go get a cup of coffee or a beer, come back to it a little bit. Not before lab. I like having my labs in the morning now because I used to be like, I actually had to have that talk with students. Hey, don't go get high in your car before you show up to lab because you're going to injure yourself or someone else. I have that less of an issue with that at 9 a.m. labs, but I guess, you know, PSA, don't do that, please. <laughs> That's another one of, I had that guy rule. That guy, I had to keep, keep kicking out of lab because he showed up stumbling high. And I'm just not going to let you do chemistry the dangerous stuff at that point. Lecture, I no, I don't care at all. You do you. Still not a good idea. All right, let's do some isotopes practice. So remember that our our simple way of writing out the equation for atomic mass involved using a um, summation notation, right? Which it's tricky to get used to, but it allows us to write this, this equation out in a pretty compact way. The atomic mass for anything is equal to the sum of all the possible isotopes where, and then it's gonna be the, the percent of abundance as a fraction, which I think I forgot to use this, this figure or this uh, character for yesterday's lab. Um, that percent abundance as a, as a decimal, we call that mole fraction and we use the Greek letter chi, which looks kind of like a cursor box. 
right? So all we're doing is we're gonna take the percent abundance as a decimal times the mass of that isotope. And we just add up all the possibilities. If you have five possible isotopes, you're gonna have five percent abundances and five masses. And you just multiply them together, add up the result. And that'll give you your weighted average um, atomic mass. And if you are missing one of these components, you can do it in reverse, right? This is the magnesium problem from this week's ICA. Start by writing out the whole thing. Instead of leaving it like this, if you know how many isotopes you have and what they are, you can actually write this out in the extended form and see what pieces you're missing. Right, so in this case, if we have carbon, carbon has two naturally occurring isotopes geologically. Carbon-14 is naturally occurring, but as a result of solar radiation hitting the upper atmosphere. Um, so that is a different thing. We don't consider that occurring in, in mineral samples, for instance, so that involve carbon. So we have carbon as two naturally occurring isotopes that are included in the atomic mass of the periodic table. First off, looking at the periodic table, which of these two isotopes, carbon-12 or carbon-13, is more common? 12, because the atomic mass is a lot closer to 12 than 13, right? We don't know exactly what the atomic mass is of carbon 13 versus carbon 12 from this. We could look it up, but it's going to be really close to 12 and 13. In fact, actually, the atomic mass of carbon 12 is by definition exactly 12. That's actually what we use to define Avogadro's number is the number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon 12. So that actually is an exact number. And carbon-13 is going to be really close to 13 as well. So based on that, we can tell just qualitatively carbon-12 is more common because our atomic mass is a lot closer to 12. If we want to know in what ratio, then we just write this out. What we're really solving for are these percent abundances, these mole fractions. So in this case, if we only have two of them, what do we know about those two percent abundances? Or mole fractions, since they're not percents. Okay. We know they add up one. We don't know that they're 50-50. Actually, in fact, we know they're not 50-50, because if they were 50-50, they'd both occur at the same amount, and we'd have about 12.5 as our atomic mass on the periodic table. So we know that there's a lot more carbon-12 and carbon-13. So if we're trying to figure out how much more, we're solving for that. And we know that the two of them, the mole fraction of carbon-12 plus the mole fraction carbon-13 have to equal one. The percentages have to equal 100, but since we're doing this all with the, with the decimal equivalent, we'll just keep it equal to one. And I'll clean that up so it doesn't look like a B. It helps if I can remember what I'm trying to write. And what else do we know? We begin from the periodic table in that summation notation. We know that the, we know the atomic mass is 12.011, right? And we can put units in, but again, we're doing system equations. And so once we get our equations written and we're doing the algebra, I'm okay with us leaving the units off once we get to that point, but we should say AMU or grams per mole first. We know, so we know 12.011 AMU is equal to what? The sum of, of, yeah, chi 12 times the mass of 12 plus chi 13 times the mass of 13. Lowercase m. Uppercase m is molarity. 
So we can look these up or just assume that they're really close to exactly 12 and 13 so within zig base. So if we plug that in, we get 12.011 equals chi 12 times 12. And we'll just take it out to the same number of sig figs as we had over here. Plus chi 13. And again, without looking it up with the mass of that of carbon 13 is, we'll just call it 13.00. That's that's good enough for this problem. Um, since we're just doing this off the top of our heads, more or less. Um, if we're getting really uh, really specific, um, then then I would either provide them to you, like in the magnesium problems, or I would say go look them up. Wikipedia has uh, an entire data page dedicated to every element isotope. So you can just look up isotopes of carbon in Wikipedia, and it will show up a data table that has their mass, their half-life, how common they are, percent abundance, and stuff like that. All right, so then how do we combine these? We have two equations, two unknowns. Yeah, if we solve for one of these, we can say that mole fraction of carbon 12 is equal to one minus mole fraction of carbon 13. And then we can plug that in right here and solve for mole fraction of carbon 13. All right, so then we wind up with something like 12.011 equals one minus small fraction of carbon 13 times 12 plus small fraction of carbon 13 times 13. And I'm just saving space by not writing out all those zeros. They're still going to go to the, the, was that the thousands place. And this is the point where, because I don't really want to enter in all these numbers and combine like terms and all that by hand, I would then take this, plug it into Wolfram Alpha and have that solve it for me. You don't even really need to, to do that substitution. And the way that we would um, show your work for this on a, on a problem would be, okay, I'm gonna call X is equal to mole fraction 12 and y is equal to mole fraction of 13 and i'm just going to go plug this into to wolfram alpha so writing you know writing out your two equations doing this and saying type into wolfram alpha here's my values that's a totally valid algebra step for this class because i have faith that all of you can solve that for x that bottom equation might take you a couple tries if you're rusty on your algebra, but everybody can do that. So I'm not interested in testing you on that. And in fact, it will serve you better long-term probably to learn how to do it this way, because if you ever do wind up with any situation where you have a system of equations in the future, you're never gonna not have the internet. It's not never. Um, that is the sort of thing that they would do to you in a in a grad school final exam without prepping you for it um, and make you do a system of equations by hand in your head or a third order quadratic if they're particularly mean. So we just said x plus y equals one, comma, 12.011 equals 12, and I just minimized my Thing. Which one did we say was X was carbon 12, right? <coughs> Comma, solve. It, tell, it comes back and tells you in mathematical description what you type in. Make sure you type it in properly. So you always want to double check this. 
um, that it got your exponents where you wanted it to, or that you didn't forget parentheses if you had something like that. It graphs the two lines because they are two linear equations. But really, what we care about is result in decimal form. X is 0.989 and Y is 0.011. Which means, and I lost my sheet. Those are our percent abundances. At the very least, you should always get to see the welcome out to check your homework answers on your for your math classes. Don't use it to do your homework, um, but it will also do like multivariable path intervals and linear algebra problems and things like that too. Uh, if you learn how to how to input them properly, so. Um, very valuable tool. I don't know if it'll do statistics, but it sells better at statistics anyway. So to answer the final piece of this question is in what ratio? These are their percent abundances, but if we want to know more of a comparing it to um, a one-to-one -one ratio, we would just take these and divide them. So we can say that the ratio of 12 compared to the ratio of 13 is equal to 0 0.989 over 0 0.011. We're gonna get something really close to 100, right? And what that ratio means is that for every one carbon 13 atom, there are 89.9 carbon 12 atoms. Or if you flipped these, you would get something really close to 0.01, which would mean for every one carbon 12 atom, there's 0.01 carbon 13 atoms, or 1% of your atoms are carbon 13. 1.1% technically, but who's counting? That was a joke. <laughs> um, so one of the one of the few places that you will actually not have the natural distribution of, of isotopes is anytime you've got a, what's known as an enriched sample. And enriched uranium is literally just means that they take all the different isotopes of uranium. And they separate out the different isotopes so that you can have a sample that's got extra uranium 238 in it compared to uranium 235. Because uranium 2, and I always mix these two up, uranium 238 is the one that you can you build a bomb with, but uranium 235, you can build a power plant with. Um, and so you need them at, cert at a certain ratio to build a power plant versus the bomb, and that enrichment. Um, it's just changing that ratio of isotopes away from what's not found in nature. And they literally just use a giant centrifuge. It's really, really cool. They spin these things in a centrifuge with so much gravity that the, the um, more heavy isotopes separate out of the box. And the, the technology that you need to get it to be weapons grade is like a hundred times more complicated than the technology you need to enrich it to power plant grade, which is why it's really, really obvious for uh, inspectors to be able to go into a country and see whether they're actually trying to make bombs or not, um, which is why countries that are trying to make bombs just don't let in human inspectors. Um, now, trust us, we're totally just making power plant uranium. Don't worry about it. You don't need to check anything. Um, that's that's literally the logic for uh, why Iran and, and uh, North Korea don't let human inspectors look at their their power plants in their enrichment facilities. All right, 
what do we do if we have an enriched sample that's 75% carbon-13? If you convert it to a decimal, what is that 75%? It's not that, I guess, the word natural is a misnomer at this point. It's the abundance, right, as a percentage. So if we turn it into a decimal, that's our mole fraction. So if our mole fraction of carbon-13 is, is 0.75, what's our mole fraction of carbon-12? 0.25. And so our atomic mass then works the same way, we just have different weights. It's the same masses, we're just gonna multiply them by a different, uh, a different percent, or not percent abundance, the other one, mole fraction. Right, so we would wind up with 0 0.25 times 12.00 AMU plus 0 0.75 times mole frac or times the mass. So I can even do that math in my head. And actually, we'd only keep two sig figs in this case anyway. So I didn't give enough sig figs for us to even actually be able to see it um, because we wound up having around it 13. But if we if we said that was 75.0%, we'd be able to see that our atomic mass is now different because we have a different mixture of isotopes. Right? And this is some so everybody. Everybody's usually somewhat interested in the word nuclear because it's interesting. Nuclear power is a big topic, and nuclear weapons are really, really terrifyingly cool. Cool in the way that they're terrifying. Take a pick. Um, but uh, the other place this gets used is actually in biochemistry, is because we know that naturally only 1% of the atoms are carbon 13. So if we can make a sample of a biological molecule like glucose, where all of the carbons have been have been replaced with carbon 13 instead of carbon 12, we can actually follow those carbons through the metabolism of the cell. And we can see, okay, with the glucose start, that's how that's how we first figured out how glycolysis works. Is because, okay, well, we're starting with all this, we're adding this glucose with it's all carbon 13, and now all of a sudden we have all this oxaloacetate that's made out of carbon 13. That must mean that that's part of that pathway. Otherwise, where did all that carbon-13 come from? And so you can actually track step by step through the entire metabolic process in the cell by doing this carefully. Uh, it's similar to what they do with um, if you have a problem, um, a uh, thyroid condition or something. Certain um, elements, specifically iodine, is when it gets used a lot. Iodine accumulates in your thyroid because it uses iodine more than. Um, any other part of your body, really. And so if they inject you with a certain isotope of iodine, it's different than the naturally occurring isotope of iodine, they can see how that moves through your thyroid and kind of diagnose things that way. So a lot of times that's what, what's referred to as radio, radio medicine or nuclear medicine um, is that field of basically making these figuring out what isotopes would be useful and then making them and administering them and then using things like an MRI or an X-ray um, to trace them through the body. And nuclear medicine is what it's called mostly. Um, but random aside, it, it does show up sometimes. All right, let's talk about Mendeleev. We'll do story time at the end of class because Mendeleev is fascinating. Um, and if you hadn't even 100, you've heard this already, but we'll hear it again. Um, Mendeleev is this dude who, I mean, granted everybody in photographs from this time period look kind of like this, um, maybe not quite so beardy and untrimmed, but they all kind of have that like staring off into the distance. Um, I've seen some shits there. Um, <laughs> Probably because they had, but also because you had to sit and stare for five minutes straight to take a picture, right? Um, so Mendeleev was Russian. He lived in, a, in uh, the, he was born in the early 1800s. Um, 
And in 1969, you noticed that if you if you list the elements, at this point, they just had tables at the back of, of a chemistry textbook would just have a list of elements, usually alphabetic or sometimes like chrono chronologically when they were discovered. Um, Mendeleev was the one who realized that if you list them by size, if you sort by size, then patterns show up. Every eight elements, you got things that had similar properties. Hydrogen has similar properties to fluorine. And then eight elements later, fluorine has similar properties to fluorine. And so on. And the noble gases, what we call now call the noble gases. Helium is really similar in properties to neon. And eight elements later, you get argon. And eight elements later, you get krypton. Um, and so he noticed these patterns, which was a really remarkable thing. Like data science is a whole piece now, right? That's a whole major. You can, you can make your career in just in understanding how to manipulate data. They didn't have Excel. It wasn't as easy as like, I'm going to plot these things and Excel. No, you, had, you had to write this out by hand, notice the pattern first, and then put it out, and then convince other people that this was a real pattern um, all by hand, which led to some really weird looking tables that don't look quite like what we expect, um, what we think of as the periodic table. But he was, so he, basically took this pattern and said, okay, well, anything that has similar properties, I'm putting it in the same column. And grouped all the different known elements according to what their properties were. Oddly enough, he was the first person to think of this. They've been, you know, chemistry had existed um, in one form or another for about 200 years by this point, and nobody had thought to do this yet. It seems really obvious looking at it now, right? Especially given we're used to seeing a periodic table in columns. Um, and what he found was almost what was more important than the fact that he that there was some sort of structure to it was that he found gaps. And Mendeleev's table wasn't perfect because he did it according to mass rather than the atomic number because he didn't know what a proton was at that point. Nobody knew about protons. This is before the plum pudding model had been disproved. And so, you know, the, all we really knew is well, size gives us these weird properties, and it shows that there should be atoms here where we don't know about it. And it predicted what those atoms should act like, what their relative mass should be. It should be about this. It should react about like these other elements, and it allowed them to find all these elements that were there all along, but in small enough amounts that until you knew to look for them, they, everybody just assumed that their samples were contaminated or there was the uncertainty in the measurements that were throwing off things like measuring the density of aluminum. But really it was the fact that the aluminum also had germanium in it, right? So finding these gaps allowed them to then fill them in. Um, and just as we're, as we're ending up here in a minute or two, We'll end a little bit early today. Um, just because I always like to make the point that scientists are not perfect. Even a brilliant guy like Mendeleev, um, you know, led a, I always refer to it as a, as a Russian, a Russian epic tragedy, like reading War and Peace. Um, the, because his, you know, he was born youngest of 17 kids or 19, depending on what's what, what uh, um, what source you believe you listen to. Um, one of only about half that survived to adulthood. Uh, he was born into a nice, cushy middle-class family. His, his father taught uh, literature at the uh, Russian University in St. Petersburg, maybe. Um, one of the Western Russian cities. Um, and then right as he starts growing up and becoming you know, a, a teenager, his dad goes blind. And it's, it's not like the, the uh, they had unions for professors in Russia in the 1800s. So he immediately lost his job. That's how you teach literature in the 1800s if you can't see. Um, so then his mom had to go back to work. Luckily, her family was middle class and she went to work for a factory that her uncle had built, um, which less than a year later burned down. So, you know, double whammy. Both of his parents are out of work. He's the youngest of 19. Everybody else has grown up and left the nest, um, but he's 
Yeah, he's still stuck with his parents who are destitute and they move across all of Russia to Siberia practically um, because there was a university there and his mom thought he was special. Um, and like just a really smart kid. So we're just gonna go move across the entire continent um, for that. And so he had to relearn everything once he got there. Um, and he did turn out to be very special, obviously very smart and um, discovered some really interesting things and was a, just a real dick about it too. Um, the Russian things, if you take a organic chemistry, there's a whole saga between some, some of Mendeleev's um, eventual um, academic family tree is that whose advisor um, was your advisor's advisor, you can't call it like your grand advisor, um, and you can trace that back and develop like academic lineages. And so part of Mendeleev's academic lineage is a few, um, almost uh, a few decades later, there's some organic chemists named Markovnikov and Zaitsev that really hated each other and they were both in the same group. It's a really common story in Russian um, chemists. So take organic chemistry. If you want to hear about Zaitsev versus Markovnikov, it's really funny. Um, Markovnikov got the best of them. Um, Mendeleev predicted the existence of germanium, led the way to discovering it, but Mendeleev was not German, he was Russian. So when they finally discovered germanium, proved it existed, they didn't name it anything related to Russia, or Mendeleev, they named it after Germany, who was Russia's deathly rival at the time, both in sciences and like in world politics. Um, pretty, as best I can tell, as a direct FU to Mendeleev, because he was that much of a jerk. Um, and still, so he was alive, he was nominated for, the, for a Nobel Prize in chemistry for like 20 years in a row literally invented the periodic table, right? Shoe in for a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Um, never won it because everybody who was alive and voting knew what a jerk he was. Um, and eventually, after he'd been dead for close to 100 years, um, they discovered an element and everybody who remembered him had been dead, he was dead now, or at least retired and not voting. That's when you finally get an element named after Mendeleev. It's way down in row seven of the periodic table because of what a jerk he was. And I like to point this out because scientists aren't perfect. They discover really cool things. They might be admirable in some ways, but they're also just people. And apparently the Russian chemists in the 1800s were just jerks. So, and on that note, we'll go ahead and end, and we'll pick up by talking about all of these folks. Yeah, yeah. 